think, correct me if I'm wrong, Richard and I are the cedar elders, or, or crinklies, as we call ourselves. Um, and I thought in a position of being a, a cedar crinkly, it might be quite a nice thing to take a trip down memory lane. Um, research is my trade. And um, I'm excited about the possibility of, of CEDA re-engaging with, with some kind of research agenda. Um, this came about um, because I was asked to do a talk at a conference on resilience um, last year. And I put together a mechanical engineer's view of what resilience might mean, which seems to be the new trendy word for sustainability, so we might as well get on board with it, really. Um, I'm going to dedicate the talk to Howard, a reminder that Howard was one of the co-founders of, of CEDA and uh, a huge influence in terms of, of how we now go forward. Um, he was uh, an architect, founder of, of Gaia in Scotland, a teacher, um, a fantastic ecological designer and a volunteer. He's also the author of Eco Minimalism, which I commend to you all because I have nine and a half grandchildren to support. Thank you. Um, a great little read. When Howard and I met, um, I was working at the Building Services Research and Information Association and founding, uh, doing a kind of under studies on environmental impact of building services. And at that time, um, around 1990 to 94, nobody seemed to have really heard of things like CFCs and CO2 and, and things like that. It was, it was um, quite new, surprisingly new. And I was addressing a lot of building services issues and trying to form a framework for how we, we move forward towards more passive design and designing services out of buildings. And I was looking for case studies. I was working uh, as an advisor to the BRE on their Office of the Future. And whilst looking for other case studies, I met Howard, who was way ahead of the game anyway. He was already designing stuff from, from innovative low-impact buildings, the, the John Chapel building, which never got built, looking at innovative ventilation systems, um, looking at, at solar studies, solar design, passive design. It was great. Um, it was a struggle to get to talk to him, but I managed it eventually. Um, and in fact, three and a half hours after I managed to get him to talk to me, he asked me to marry him. So that was, that was kind of, we got there. Um, between us, we then decided to form the Gaia Group. And we formed the Gaia Group on the basis that we would do research, which I was already doing. We delivered that into design, which is what Howard's business was. We would then evaluate it, which is, again, my area of, of expertise seek to learn from that, disseminate what we were finding, the good and the bad, get some feedback, which you'd then take forward to capacity build and train other people to do more sustainable buildings. And that then would lead us to understand what more research was needed. All in pursuit of innovation in the built environment in terms of sustainable buildings. Great agenda, fantastic, fantastic years in which to do it. The kind of research we did was everything from uh, passive stack ventilation systems and culverts, moisture mass in buildings, dealing with moisture, solar cooling, um, low impact buildings, animal architecture, innovative use of timber, daylighting, and there's loads of stuff, loads of stuff. And we then went ahead um, and looked at how we would get these into design projects. And it was a brilliant interactive relationship because I could actually get access to funding because I had the potential to get things built. And Howard didn't have to then spend lots of additional money doing the research that he wanted to do because he got that synergy in terms of that, that relationship. So Glencoe, McLaren, um, Plumbers Wood, um, Glentress, Tollhouse Gardens, which was low allergy housing, all of those were design projects which came about from, from research agenda. And, of course, one of the underpinning things of this was that when Howard and I had met, I was trying to design the building services out of buildings. Howard wanted to design the building service engineer out of buildings uh, on the basis that the only good building service engineer is the next one. As a chartered building service engineer, I can say that. Um, we then went on to evaluate where we could. Not a lot of money around for evaluating how buildings work, but, but we've done some. We've done as much as, as we can. 
um, generally in a way that we wanted to do it as well. The dissemination activities, it's all stuff which is on the web. Um, most of that material is there in, in some shape or form, including the work that, that was done with CEDA um, on the low impact materials. On the basis of that, we then went on to produce a CPD series, which is also now web-based. I did it as a series of, of modules, uh, 15 of them in total. That was because I put one of 15 on the front of the first one. Didn't need to do that. One would have been perfectly adequate. And that was web-based now, so it's got links to Gaia projects, it's got links to the original module, and it was eventually published by Butterworth Heinemann in 2007. And what I predominantly do now is capacity building. I work with clients, with architects, with design teams to help them to deliver more sustainable buildings affordably on the basis that you don't need any more money to do it, you just need a bit of intelligent procurement and uh, specification and some good advice and constant vigilance, all of which make, I make it sound much easier than it is. Uh, Howard and I also shared uh, a, a huge concern for the fact that the sustainability word had been degraded and abused by overuse and underambition. And I very much wanted to get back to a different sort of discussion that took us away from this tendency of the 95% of the conversation about sustainability to be the urban wind turbine. We kind of came to the conclusion that people talk about sustainability like 11-year-olds talk about sex, which is a lot, but not with any great insight and not with any great inclination to ask anybody else who might know something else about it. So I wanted very much to get back to talking about the D word, because I think people actually do understand what the D word means. It does genuinely mean how tomorrow can be better than today. And that's quite a simple concept. And so moving on to the sort of idea of, of development, I then thought it'd be quite interesting to see where this idea of sustainable development came from. So I'm going to take you back through a little bit of this, this history. So the Club of Rome, uh, about 30 people, influential people, mainly blokes, uh, got together to talk about things that they thought were important, important to all nations, and out with the ability of any individual nation to deal with. Um, Recognise any of them. Um, I'd like to say that 46 years on or so, uh, we haven't actually moved this agenda forward a great deal. What the Club of Rome did was they had their own research agenda. And this was a very optimistic time, seriously optimistic time. We'd just gone through the Industrial Revolution, the Green Revolution, and food production had increased across the globe by a third in a 10-year period. So this optimism suggests that the more demand you put on the environment, it's fine because the environment, the Earth's ability to sustain us, will also increase at the same rate. Well, it seemed obvious then. And what the Club of Rome actually discovered was that this came at a considerable cost, both in terms of things like pesticide use, but also the actual financial costs of nitrates and, and kit to make this happen. And they actually began to wonder and raise the questions that, that maybe this wasn't sustainable. And they also compared it to what happens in nature. And they reckoned that there are very few examples of nature in nature of this kind of exponential growth. Uh, what they identified is actually systems tend to oscillate. You don't get exponential growth. In fact, you know, even the universe expands and contracts. What you tend to do is get a population which expands against its environment. Um, mice had a very good year last year because they were under the snow and the owls were above the snow and couldn't get them. This year, owls have had a better year because there hasn't been so much snow and there's loads and loads of mice. So that's much more of a way that natural systems tend to operate. And I just come back to this idea of resilience and what we mean by resilience. And that oscillation bears a very close resemblance to a mechanical engineer's view of what resilience is. 
which is that it's a period within any system, if you put any kind of uh, strain on it, then actually it can always go back to where it was before. It's called the elastic region. And the interesting thing is you don't know where that elastic system stops until you do it. That's the nature of testing a natural system. What they drew attention to was the danger of overshoot, which is a population expands beyond the ability of the Earth to come back and thereby sustain it. So you've actually taken away that underpinning oscillation. And that bears an interesting relationship with what you call the plastic in resilience terms, which is you only have to do a little bit. Once you've gone past the yield strength, you don't have to do very much for something to actually change very considerably. And you've gone way beyond the point where it can actually return to how it was before. You've stretched it beyond its limits. After which, of course, it's broke. For good, forever, gone. And you don't know when that's going to happen until you do it. Be concerned, be very concerned. So what the Club of Rome guys did was they suggested that we should try and recognise that the Earth was limited in its capacity to sustain us, that there were limits to growth, and that we should try very hard to understand, recognise those limits, and live within them. Again, seems, seems quite sensible now. And that became known as the beyond uh, the limits, which is my good idea number one. I shall shoot through the rest, of course. Infinite growth on a finite planet is an impossibility. It's... I, good idea number one gained some favour in a few quarters, but quite honestly, not a huge amount of favour. Not really. Um, it's been, been a long time since. And um, Small is Beautiful, it had an influence in terms of, of how people respond to the environment, but not a huge cultural influence. So moving on, uh, Stockholm Conference 1972 was the first time when I think there were 113 nations got together to talk about development and the effects of pollution and what would happen if, for goodness sake, China, Brazil, India started burning coal at the same rate as, as Western nations were doing that, God forbid. And of course, the instant reaction of, of many of the developing nations was anger, uh, frustration at the moralising and the restraint that was being imposed on them by these Western nations who thankfully had got fat and, and rich by destroying the Earth's resources and polluting the Earth. What's interesting is that that wasn't the final conclusion. The final conclusion of the Stockholm Conference was that actually it was pragmatic and it was in everybody's self-interest if we recognised the limits to growth. And somehow or other, there was a need to get together to decide how that would happen um, that, I will put to you, was good idea number two. I think it sort of died the same painful, ringing death uh, as good idea number one, um, because, you know, many of us use, you know, 1.2, 1.3. Uh, lots of people need four planets to survive. Um, just a reminder, we still have the one. Good idea number three um, is the brainchild of, of Rachel Carson, who... Uh, back, in, back in the day, um, started looking at the impacts of pesticide use on the natural environment and was, was, was frankly, ridiculed um, by most of, of the scientific population in doing so. Um, it was a remarkable agenda um, in which she talked about ourselves as being part of the natural environment. The other thing was that it wasn't actually a wasn't a cuddly agenda. She wasn't looking down her microscope at pandas. Um, she, was, she was actually looking down her microscope at, at the basic underpinning organisms of, of, of what happens on the, on the planet. Um, I will probably... Uh, she died in 50 years ago on the 14th of April, on my 7th birthday. I kind of... I'm used to the idea that bees are, are dying. I've known that bees are dying for at least 30 years and probably more. Um, it gets revisited every so often in a sort of journalistic sense, you know, yet again a reminder that bees are dying. Uh, but, yeah, I think good idea number three in terms of how we deal with it in terms of the building, built environment has also 
been a bit doomed. You know, we get, this is the sort of thing we get. We could have that. We get it very rarely. Um, the sort of way that we react as built environment professionals to biodiversity. It's, it's marginal. It's culturally marginal. That's a school. Marvellous environment. Um, we could. It's not, not everybody behaves like this in, in Germany. Um, that's a school. Playground. You couldn't do that here because the children would, would drown running away from the paedophiles. Um, there is an aspect, a commercial aspect to many of these good ideas in that you get these sorts of things now appearing at, at garden shows. Um, unfortunately, it tends to be alongside the roundup in the same way that you get solar panels at B&Q next to the air conditioning wall bangers. Um, they, they're still, you know, they, it's a commercial interest, not a, not a cultural imperative, if you like. So good idea number four, Barry Commoner, who stood for president of the United States on, on ecological principles, one of which was everything must go somewhere. And this brings us to where the toxicity issues, um, first being raised by, by Carson, uh, but much more generally now in terms of how we deal with, with the planet, have entered the whole industrial cycle and the whole environmental cycle. So everything must go somewhere, something that this, the smallest child will tell you. Paul Hawkin. Um, of Findhorn fame and, and Factor 4 uh, once asked a question uh, about what will eat your building um, which I always thought was a really important one in terms of how we look at toxicity cycles um, some of the quango stroke government initiatives in this respect I find quite, quite disturbing uh, you're allowed to do this, in fact you're positively encouraged to do this um, by you know, recycling initiatives and RAP and all these sorts of things frankly I think that the car industry, the rubber industry, and the, and the Diageo should, should actually be sent away to sort out their own problems and not dump them on, on us. Um, once this toxicity has entered the, the chain, it's not, this isn't a building material. This, this is a joke. Uh, I was told by some guys at Briam when I asked them, you know, when they do their rating schemes, everything gets an A rating for a roof, you know, zinc, aluminium, whatever you want, green roofs, they're all A. To which I said, if that's the case, what about a timber roof? And, and I was quite clearly told that you can't design a timber roof, which was a shame because we'd already done it um, more than once. And that sort of raises this issue about what resilience means within the construction industry and within the corridors of power, which is there's deep suspicion of designing out problems where you actually just take things in their natural form um, and, and use them. Um, people are much happier if you're actually prepared to throw a copper chrome and arsenic at, at a product and turn it from a perfectly natural recyclable material into a piece of toxic waste. And many of you have seen, how did I talk before, will have seen um, this, which is this huge expansion in the number of toxic materials that, that we use. Um, back in the 1900s, there were very few building materials. Uh, as those have expanded, so have the number of toxic ones as well. And all we're doing with this um, all this nasty stuff is transform, uh, transferring that liability to the future. And, and on occasion also, you know, environments like this where you've got nice volatile organic compounds all over the paints on the walls, all being nicely breathed in by the children using the toilets, but because they smell anyway and they're badly ventilated and we're really rubbish at designing buildings, especially ones you know, spaces like this, then you put some nice chemicals in there that the children also breathe in. Um, negative compounded or negative. Which brings me to conclude that as much as I want to talk about development, and this is an environment where development has, a, has specific meanings, actually development is actually quite a nasty word. Because most of it is toxic and polluting and equitable and, and um, undermining of communities and of biodiversity. So we've really got a bit of a challenge on our hands, I think, within the sorts of things that, that we do. Which brings me to, to my next good idea, which is if partly comes out of the limits to growth agenda, but it's really about the limits to growth are not actually a consequence of the number of cars on the planet, or for that matter, the number of products. Wellington boots, or even the number of babies on the planet. It's not a numbers thing. Actually, the limits to growth are the resources that those babies, cars, 
Wellington boots take in their lifetime and the waste that they produce and where that's going to go. So there's an element in which you can look at how you build that into a circular economy. But once you've got this toxicity into the system as well, that becomes very strictly limited as well. So you've got to get the toxicity out before you can really start the circular economy. Just another very short example, uh, which I thought might be cute in terms of the numbers game. Uh, this is an enabler scheme in Tübingen. Um, it's uh, three storeys. Um, it's it, it low-impact materials. It's got all the passive solar. It's a lovely place. It's got all this lovely biodiverse, rich uh, environment in the middle of it. And the density of that is the same as that block of flats behind. It's a design thing. And, and it's because it's a design thing that I think this idea that there are limits to growth but no limits to development is a designer's dream. That's what, you, that's what you want to know. That's what we're here for. We're here to be innovative, researchy, think through problems and deliver new solutions. There are initiatives where you're trying to get these circular econo economies going. This is the plan for Hamaboo, more or, more or less successful, maybe less successful. And then stuff that we've done as, as Gaia International, looking at synergies between urban and rural environments, how you make those, those work in resource terms as well. Again, toxicity is a problem. You need to get that out before any of this is going to work. Next good idea. Next good idea is, oh, it's this one. Um, this is still pretty much the predicted um, climate change scenario, pretty much. Um, it's, been, it's been much the same for a long time. I think the important thing is that this 2.8 by 2020 um, is also fits within that scope. But this is from my Building Biology in Colour, Volume 5, which was, I had in 1972. Um, and I was a reasonable good little chemist, really reasonably good little physicist, and I had absolutely no reason to believe that this was not true. And I, to this day, wonder... Where was everybody else? This was me. Where was everybody? And I wonder whether or not it's because most of our ruling class people who make decisions um, tend to come from a sort of legal background or something, where there's no such thing as truth, there's no such thing as a fact. You don't go to court for justice. You go to court to win. Um, in some shape or form, the precautionary principle uh, as good idea number, number six. Um, if we'd invested even a small amount of thought and innovation back in, when was it, 1971, in looking at these things, which were already published in books, I've still got it, um, we might not be in the situation that we're in now. Right, this is my superhero moment. If I could be a superhero for a minute or a week or 50 years or something, um, I would intervene every time I heard the word energy generation put together. Can't bear it. Um, everybody talks about megawatts. It's endless. Nobody but nobody talks about megawatts. It still has no credence whatsoever. Can't get round it at all. And the way that we take this kind of energy generation forward is... is I don't know, I think it's quite pitiful, actually. This is lovely. This is pitiful at all. This is Elvis. I wanted to call my book Elvis and Sustainable Construction, but my publishers were boring. When I publish it myself, I will do. Uh, I don't know what McGeek Boy is called. Um, but uh, nice little experiment. You know, that's exactly what you should be doing when your spotty is getting your hamster to charge up your mobile phone. Perfect. Um, this is less interesting an experiment because this is a grown-up thing where you're spending £20,000 to light some bulbs outside Sainsbury's um, during the day. Or, or this, even less interesting, I don't know, 16 square metres of solar panels facing east about an angle of 11 degrees, which are there to educate children, apparently. Educate children about how stupid their teachers are. And it is, frankly, it's pathetic. Um, we know the contribution of renewables to the overall UK economy is something like 3-4%-ish. We know how to save 3-4% without those nasty words which are now banned. Actually, if you're going to design something which has got a daylight stairwell, can you turn the lights off? Put a switch in it so people might use it. Turn the thermostats down, that's from the RIBA. What 
joys. They, had a, they actually had a um, renewables exhibition on the roof when they had that in the loos. Um, turn the lights off. So this aspect of human control has also now been dropped, the whole human factors in how we deal with the environment, where the control is being taken away from, from us um, to do our own conservation as well. So we're not that smart. We're not even that smart. And, you know, how tiresome. When you've got south-facing room, you've got all the computers stuffed into south-facing room at lunchtime, and that's why you end up with the air conditioning unit. And that's, that's not untypical. We see, you know, endless amounts of, of that kind of stuff. Oh, you've got the internal blinds, of course, which are useless, because by then the sun's got in anyway. Uh, all in all. And we know the endless example, that's the John Hope Centre, which down at, at the Botanics, which has got more bling than you could possibly imagine. It's all there. Um, what it's also got is, is this so-called innovative roof system with the inflatable, uh, air inflatable daylighting technique. Um, but a poor bit of detailing, if you notice. Poor bit of detailing, because they'd forgotten they had to keep these things pumped up as well. And they keep them pumped up with this big bit of kit. And I can tell you now that none of that bling on that roof goes anywhere near actually dealing with the requirements of keeping that inflated. Um, and, of course, the air leakage and all the rest of the stuff that wasn't quite thought through. We're not very good at this. You know, we need some research and we need some dissemination and we need some, some serious activity. Every other industry knows that you don't put solar panels on a HGV. You, know, you make them small, you make them sleek, you might make them colourful as well, but you... Yeah, actually, this is what we need to be doing, and we're nowhere near it. Uh, there are loads of natural resources we can use. There's the insulation agenda, of course, um, and there's the, the air tightness agenda. And as one of Howard's students put it, no limits to development. Um, that's the designing out the building services preferably designing out a building service engineer. And of course, there are all, we've all got examples. I'm sure you've all seen these in, in some of the, the good old early books, the crinkly books, uh, about how there are lots of examples of very high external temperatures being dealt with by very low technology solutions, whether or not it's, it's looking at uh, hot environments or the igloo, the very cold environments. So on to how we deal with things more passively. Then um, these are very good examples in Germany of row houses back from 10, 12 years ago, probably row passive houses. Um, no great problem with them. Still a very early agenda. Whereas our first passive houses, um, I'm afraid that is a photograph under the stairs at Bedshead. If it doesn't work, you need the evaluation, you need the feedback to take it forward because there's no nothing dies quicker than a, you know than actually an idea that's lied about. Um, had we actually had some decent feedback uh, from that project, we could actually have learned something. Um, the passive design that, that we've been undertaking was a caracal, but at the time was designed as a passive school. It was based on the te one tenth of the normal requirement for a building, which we took as a kind of factor ten system then. But we didn't want to put in mechanical ventilation because we didn't think it was necessary, we didn't think it was appropriate to do that. Um, we then went on to look at Plumber's Wood, uh, which is a house, um, something of a luxury house, which did go for passive certification um, and got it. Um, and the interesting thing about this is what we've shown by evaluating that is that it would operate just as energy efficiently without the MVHR if we'd put in trickle vent instead. We've done the monitoring um, and it will be published soon. So the whole idea that we move towards passive house without sufficient research on how passive houses are actually operating is a bit of a worry. Research agenda for anybody who wants to grab that one and run. Um, there's not enough feedback, um, and there's a lot of religion around it as well, which is a bit worrying. Uh, right, when I say that I, um, I'm involved in ecological buildings and support for ecological buildings, everybody thinks that I work with buildings like this. I love this. I love this building. It was designed and built by a load of disaffected youth in northern Germany uh, some time ago. Their kids are now grown up themselves and use it and play pinball in it. Decentralisation, who takes decisions about what and how robust those decisions might be. If you ask people 
to get involved in their own design and solutions, then they actually deliver up things which are appropriate to, to, to them. Uh, if you simply go to the commercial agenda and commercial markets, it's just a branch of banking, isn't it? Uh, so getting them involved, um, and that's what we tend to do uh, in some shape or form. Brilliant little designers um, when they're young. Anybody who's getting involved in solving their own problems is engaged in understanding what those are. Uh, we looked at, when we've done work on schools, we looked at getting kids involved um, in their own schools design and development, um, and you can read about that level of, um, of involvement and what it produced in the design and construction books that we did on schools. Um, another aspect of getting engaged in that subsidiarity was when uh, Howard and Drew from Gaia Planning got engaged with the Fairfield Estate, which in 1937 had been a, a fantastic new uh, project which was meeting the needs of the town elders um, and by 84 had fallen into complete and utter disrepair. What Drew and Howard did was then to put together a programme for these guys to build their own um, collective that would help them to pull themselves up by their bootstraps based on this Gadesian agenda of folk work and, and place. Um, and we do this all the time, get people involved at the right level that we consider it to be. Um, kids very much want to be involved in development of their futures because, as they will tell you, they're going to live longer than you, so they get to make all the decisions, which is fair enough. It worked with Fairfield. Um, it worked very well. It's now a thriving community. And when we did an audit uh, in, 90, in 87, Unemployment was 80%, there were 33% empty flats, there were loads, hordes of people wanting to move out. And you can actually turn any community around if you give people the power to do that. Unemployment down to 19%. Uh, crime down to none, which is a bit worrying. I was, I was kind of slightly concerned about the enforcement structures on that one. Good idea number 10 actually goes back to this idea of getting people involved practically and actively um, in, in their own solutions. And it takes me back to my origins. Um, I did a course called Engineering, Design and Appropriate Technology back in the 80s. And that came out of the Lucas Aerospace Initiative. And the Lucas Aerospace Initiative, for anybody who doesn't know, was when Lucas Aerospace lost its big defence contracts, couldn't make armaments anymore, and the trade unions offered to step in with a load of skilled workers and came up with all of their design plans for making bikes, bike racks, kidney machines, socially useful stuff. Um, and good idea number 10 went the same place, pretty much as good ideas number one to nine, which has had its life wrung out of it. Um, and Lucas closed down. Um, it did, however, give rise to the course that I then went on to do, and also to things like the Centre for Appropriate Technology, and other approaches to social use for production and, and appropriate technology. Uh, good idea number 11 is actually concerned with money and financial systems. Um, I did say earlier um, the, the fact that um, infinite growth on a finite planet is an impossibility. Clearly not if you're an economist. And that is the way the whole economic cycle has, has been going. I'm just like to put across to you some ideas. I want to re run this as a CEDAR event. Um, looking at people money, looking at transition economies um, as being a vital aspect of how we, we move forward, uh, both as communities but also as an industry itself. Um, just I don't have time to do very much on this, it's worth, very much worth an event. If you invested one penny in one AD at 4% interest, you could have bought a ball of gold, the weight of the earth, in 1821. That's a penny. Interestingly, because it's cumulative interest, by 1839 you could have bought two of them, solid gold earths. Uh, and, yeah, you did thousands of them by the time you got to 2003. Thousands and thousands of them by now. This is not in any way a sustainable agenda, and yet it's the one that underpins everything that, that we do. So that's good idea number 11. Um, there is a recognition now um, that you know, perhaps we need to be more um, interventionist, if you like, in terms of how we, we make decisions about our built environment. We've got we've got Portus doing her, her review of, of the new superstore and realising that it does actually stop a hundred flowers blooming and the money does all get exported out of the system. And in that sense, I think this idea of, of the transition economies and people money 
um, really does have mileage. Uh, this is Penang uh, in Malaysia, which is really just an example to show that there's nowhere that's so beautiful the construction industry can't make a complete and utter mess of it. Uh, there's miles and miles and miles of this stuff. And it's really just to say that it's taken a very long time for the resistance, uh, for sustainable development to be perceived, not as a restraint on development, but as a restraint on inappropriate development. And again, I see that as being a research agenda going forward. Now, good idea number 12, I find particular favour with me. It's the brainchild of the incoming youthful heir of the Kingdom of Bhutan. 19-year-olds and educated in the UK. I don't know where he got this from. Um, but he went forward with the idea that gross national happiness was more important than, than GNP. And it actually helped Bhutan avoid a lot of the development problems of a lot of other nations. Um, whether or not that will continue into the future is yet to be seen. Um, we now actually are required, we have been required for some time by the EU to produce our own indicators of gross national happiness which is ridiculed, as you would expect one of my good ideas to be. Um, these, essentially, what are proposed to you here are the tools of my trade. These are the things that I use in the work that I do. And I didn't actually ever set out to be on the margins. It wasn't, you know, I, I didn't kind of leg it into the engineering industry thinking, yeah, I just want to be marginal. Um, I just want to be intelligent, and I did want to use things which I thought were good tools to use. So it never ceases to surprise me that my short history of good ideas is actually a long history of missed opportunities. Is it too late? Oh, I don't know. I don't know. Where are we on the scale of, of resilience? Where were we when Rachel Carson was around? You know, when she was first raising those ideas, had we passed the yield strength in terms of DDT? We don't know. Where are we now? I think we'll all take a view, depending on our levels of optimism, pessimism, or searing moments of optimism within searing moments of pessimism. Um, I think it's very difficult to know. I think what I am curious to know is how good it would, it would be if we dealt with all of these things with a solid research agenda, because that is resilient design, to my mind. Um, there are some optimistic shoots. Uh, I won't deny it. Uh, I won't labour them either because I'm not that optimistic. Um, I took this picture probably about 10 years ago um, on the Marylebone Road. It doesn't look like that anymore. You know, there's a, there's a lot more going on. There is good mixed-use development where people take these things on board, but it tends to kind of rise and then fall off again. There's no kind of consistency. So you do get good projects like Tubingen where they've actually managed to take on board a good holistic agenda and create good places. Uh, but again, Emshire Park, uh, a beautiful development of a indu run-down industrial um, region into something which is significantly more beautiful and more sustainable. Um, but I think it still begs the question of the 12 good ideas. Um, and I would invite you to come with me and travel down the road not yet taken properly, and try and turn some of these good ideas into things which are cultural values, not peripheral ones, more mainstream values, and not, and not marginal ones. Thank you very much. <laughs>